Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXGS Weekly episode 151, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And do we got some cool stuff today, so let's get cracking. As usual, the first section of the week is getting started and uh, we have some amazing stuff in here today, starting with Get started modding Factorio in TypeScript, probably my favorite one from getting started section this week around. And just as you guessed from title, this is a tutorial on how to mod Factorio, a game about building factories using TypeScript. Someone wrote the compiler for it and it seems pretty amazing. So if you are into gaming and modding, do absolutely check this one out. Next thing we got here is how to safely access view refs without getting undefined, a pretty nice write up on the view refs and how to handle some edge cases. Next one is undefined versus null revisited, a really good write up on undefined and null from Dr. Axel Rauschmeier. So if you're still somehow confused by them, do check this one out. Next one is introduction to Aleph, the React framework in Deno. This is essentially a tutorial for Aleph, which is the next JS like framework for Deno. So do check it out. Next one is practical aspect oriented programming in JavaScript, a very brief intro into aspect oriented programming, uh, specifically using JavaScript in this case. So if you never heard about it, or maybe was interested in getting started, this is a good starting point. Next on is twisted colorful spheres in 3.js, yet another tutorial for 3.js and 3D graphics. Uh, this one is just as the title says about drawing colorful spheres. It's pretty cool. So you know, if you wanted to get started with uh, 3D graphics in JavaScript, do check this one out. Next one we got is don't use functions as callbacks unless they are designed for it. A pretty good write up on why you should be careful about just passing function as a callback to, well, map, reduce or whatever, because there's usually actually more than one argument. And if your function doesn't account for that, things might break. So if you are interested in more details, absolutely do go read that. Last article we got here for today is zero downtime deploys with DigitalOcean, GitHub and Docker. A pretty nice write up on how to set up the continuous deployments from GitHub using Docker, specifically in this case in DigitalOcean uh, VM, but you know, it uh, really doesn't matter if it's DigitalOcean or anything else, the principles are more or less the same. It's a bit of a pain in the ass and it does ask you to execute SSH scripts uh, remotely from the CI, which means is, you know, not exactly super safe. So still a good starting point, I guess. And if you're interested in more ways to sort of do the CD, simple CD from your for your projects and do check out Exaframe, which I built and you know, it's it's a lot easier than that, actually. So there we go shilling a bit for my own stuff. Right, that's it for the getting started section. Now we are coming to the articles and news we got three here today. Starting with uh, Cypress versus Selenium versus Playwright versus Puppeteer speed comparison, we already had the article from the same author and I believe it was the same blog even. Uh, talking about specifically Selenium, Playwright and Puppeteer, it was quite some time ago, even before the Cypress was uh, as popular as it is now, basically. So this is sort of an updated version that also talks about Cypress and compares it to those other tools. Uh, the interesting bit here is actually the Cypress is quite a lot slower than just about everything, including Selenium, which is... Um, and I guess it kind of makes sense to some extent because Cypress does provide a lot of tools over all the other tools presented here because, you know, Playwright and Puppeteer are not really testing frameworks, right? They're just automation frameworks that allow you to control the browser when Cypress gives you the testing tools and so on and so forth. And stuff like recording the video, recording the images, which is, I guess, something you could do with Puppeteer, but it's going to be a bit tricky to do it yourself, basically. And we'll probably slow it down to the same extent. But yeah, the slowdown is quite significant, to be honest. So uh, there you go. If you care about being very fast, I guess, then uh, picking Playwright, a Puppeteer or even Selenium might be better for you, which is uh, kind of curious. Again, you're losing all those features from the Cypress in progress, but uh, that's a trade off, basically, right? If you're curious about the details, there's a bunch of other technical things that the author measures. So uh, do give it a read. It's a really great article. Next thing we got here is um, article titled Firefox just walked away from a key piece of the open web a bit too clickbaity, I guess, but I just you know, I just wanted to talk about it because this is a feature that I really like personally that I permanently use uh, using my Microsoft Edge browser. Actually, uh, if you noticed, if you're watching me constantly, I've actually switched to using Firefox as my primary browser a few months ago when they fixed the bug that was basically annoying me all this time. 
and it's been great. Like the new Firefox engine is amazing. The features are really cool. The temporary, uh, what do you call them? The containers they have is amazing. Like this is probably the best feature that I love about Firefox. Everything else is great. Like the strict filtering they have is super awesome. They automatically protect you from tracking cookies, super cookies, fingerprinting, crypto miners, whatever. It's awesome. Now, the problem is, while Firefox does support progressive web apps, so like if you want a progressive web app, all of that stuff will work, the service workers, the push notifications, like whatever you can imagine, all of that stuff works, right? They opted out of uh, a feature uh, called site-specific browsers, meaning that, you know, in my case, I have those specific apps that are web apps, I guess, that I use, for example, Discord, Skype, uh, the work chat we use, the matrix, or well, whatever it's called element now, I think, I have them installed as a, essentially a shortcut, right? So if I open my start menu, so this Discord, Skype, Dice Riot, and Telegram, those are web apps, actually. And if I open that, that will open a separate window, which is essentially an isolated version of Edge that only runs this specific website, right? which is super convenient. That means I don't have to install Electron apps for them. I don't have to have a separate hundreds of megabytes of the same browser installed over and over again. I can just do that, right? And uh, Firefox, for some reason, decided they are not going to work on that. They are not going to implement it. And you're not going to be able to install the apps to desktop using Firefox, even though you can do this on mobiles for whatever reason. Like, I'm not sure what is the reasoning here. They really don't like those features and they really are against, as, like, as, as, as much as I understand, you know, from reading all the tickets and bug tracking and discussions, the people who develop Firefox are really against things like file system access and, and other things that they consider can be abused for privacy reasons, which, you know, is perfectly fair, but you can abuse just about everything else to track people. So you're already protected. So what, I, like, I honestly don't see a big problem here, but... Yeah, it's it's a bit weird and unfortunate decision, and I really hope that they will reconsider or maybe present another way of doing that because I would love to use Firefox as my only browser, but uh, so far I cannot really do that, right? For two reasons. Number one, I still like the um, Chromium DevTools a lot more. Like they provide, well, in some cases. Okay, so there are some cases when Firefox DevTools are actually better than Chromium, but in most cases, I actually would prefer to work with the Chromium DevTools because they seem to be more powerful, at least at this point. And I just cannot live without my desktop installed progressive web apps. Like this is not a feature I can say, no, I no longer want it, right? I've, I've tried using those progressive web apps as tab that are pinned, but that's just like, it's easier to switch from my taskbar, you know? And it's, 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 it's a bit unfortunate, let me put it this way. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you actually use desktop apps? Do you install it? Do you even know you could install that in like Chromium or well, just about any other browser, to be honest, I believe, uh, aside from Firefox? Well, maybe not Safari, but I'm again, I'm not no longer using Mac, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, yeah, let me know what you guys think about that. Okay, last article we got here for today is building future UIs. A really neat deep dive into how you can actually build a futuristic UIs using web technologies today. Specifically talks about the React and a bunch of libraries that you can use to do something straight out of the sci-fi movies, which is super cool. Like there is some really, really fun and really awesome things over here. Obviously all of that is sort of um, R&D, I guess, experimental technology. And, um, you know, I guess none of that would actually be convenient to use in real life because, yes, it looks cool, but uh, all those fancy animations would probably slow you down in the long run. But it does look really awesome. The write-up is really cool. And there's like a bit more details than you expect to it rather than just, you know, hey, let's slap some fancy looking stuff on top of each other and make it work. Probably a lot of that is possible because of the React ecosystem and stuff like React 3 Fiber that allows you to do crazy stuff with the WebGL. If you are curious, again, check it out. Absolutely worth reading through. It's not incredibly large, uh, but there is some very cool stuff in here. Right, that's it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We do have quite a lot of stuff here as well, starting with this PR uh, into the React master. Uh, titled Implement Native Version of Context Selectors. So React is going to be adding 
the way to select context, uh, meaning that, you know, before we had this use context hook that essentially allows you to subscribe to context, get the values from it. But every time the context changes, doesn't matter if there's one value or five values in there or object with different values and you only care about one property, your component will get re-rendered, right? That was a huge problem and there was like a bunch of workarounds, including just creating different contexts, which, I mean, I guess it works, but it's just annoying. Well, the use selected context allows you to subscribe to a given context and then define a selector that will return just one value property or whatever from that context and the components that use selected context will only re-render if that selector changed, which is just incredibly good. Like this is basically a feature that you saw in the, um, what was the recoil, right? This was the uh, state management solution from React and they're adding it into core and this is amazing. And that means that in some cases, when you just want global state management that is efficient, you would be able to just use context. Uh, it just got like a ton easier. Again, it's not yet merged and there's some discussion going on here. There are like proper RFCs uh, for comments if you have any, but it's a really awesome feature. And uh, I'll be very interested to see when it lands into the core and uh, what we can actually do Specifically, I want to try to implement this into the React, the outstated uh, state management solution that I have, which is super tiny. And at, at the moment, it just uses context basically. So I'm curious if I could enhance it using the selected context, but we're going to see how that develops. Basically, it's pretty cool. So if you are into React, do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is how to record screen actions as a puppeteer script. So this is actually a um, highlight basically of a new feature that is shi was shipped in uh, Chrome 89 DevTools. You can now enable recorder and experiments. And yes, this basically allows you to just open DevTools, click a bunch of things and then export whatever you just did as a puppeteer script, which is freaking awesome. So there you go. If you are working with puppeteer, this is probably going to be very helpful to you. Next thing we got here is introducing open web docs, a new initiative uh, from uh, quite a lot of people actually. So there's like Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, and a bunch of others, I believe. And um, they are essentially gonna be consolidating web documentation into one single open web docs platform, which I guess is supposed to replay MDN, uh, replace MDN later on because MDN is, I guess Mozilla is planning to kill it completely because you know, they made it open source and they've, fired all the technical writers who are doing an incredible job on it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, would be very interesting to see how that goes. But if we have um, one open web documentation platform that is maintained by people hired by all the big guys, it's gonna be amazing. Like I, I really hope this will replace MDN and will be of higher quality than MDN, which again is, you know, a very high bar, but there you go. So if you're curious how you can get involved, what does it entail and, and so on and so forth, there's a bit more details in here. So feel free to read that. Next thing we got here is npmjs.com now displays per version download counts, a feature that people have been asking since probably the earliest days of npmjs.com. And they finally added it. Yes, you finally can see uh, downloads per version for the last seven days. So there you go, might be quite handy if you're a maintainer of the open source project. Okay, continuing, we got the another announcement that is pretty awesome. WebRTC is now a W3C and IETF standard, which means we might see a lot more movement with regards to WebRTC protocol and uh, features, uh, which is uh, always good in my book. So do check this out. There's like a quite a good write up on what is happening and uh, why this is a good thing and what is the future of WebRTC and so on and so forth. I never really worked with WebRTC that much, so maybe I should dive into it at some point. But uh, again, you know, this is not exactly my field, so there we go. Next thing we got here is introducing Odyssey, the Apollo learning platform, a really cool new program, I guess, from the Apollo people that essentially creates a interactive learning experience for learning GraphQL. Well, in this case with Apollo specifically, as you might imagine, but it does give you, a, as far as I understand at least, I haven't tried it myself, it does give you all the basics you need to know for working with GraphQL itself. So if you were interested and if you didn't know how to get started with GraphQL, do check this one out. Seems like a really solid uh, initiative. Continuing, we got this tweet from the Matthias Binance uh, of the V8 dev team. 
the new JavaScript features in ES 2021. There is a whole list here. It's just five of them. Logical assignment operators, numeric separators, promise.any, string replace all, the graphs and fin uh, finalization registry. That is for whatever reason hard to say. And there's a bunch of articles here from the V8 dev team uh, talking about each and every of those features. So if you're interested, do check it out. Another thing we got here related to the ECMAScript is the ECMAScript proposal async do expression. So if you remember, there is a do expressions proposal that's been out there for quite some time. I think it's been, I'm not sure if it's been in stage zero or stage one, but it is stage one right now. And it's been around for a few years now, I believe. The idea is that basically you can say do something and then execute code in that inside of that do return it or implicitly implicitly return it and then whatever is executed within the do clause will be assigned or used in the previous expression right so this that you can like compute complex variables you can uh, use it in jsx for example for doing the complex logic and so on and so forth very handy very nice uh, again not sure why it's been stuck in this stage one for so long but now we have the async do expression which well basically allows you to do the same but in with async prefix and using await functions because you know everyone uses async await right now and it's very handy so that's pretty great and honestly i don't know maybe it should just be merged into one proposal to be honest uh but yeah it's great so we're gonna see where that goes and uh, how all of that is gonna end up basically Right, uh, last thing we got here for today in tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness is the announcement that module blocks just got advanced to the stage two, which is fantastic news. Uh, this is one of my probably favorite proposals that are out there right now. Essentially, the idea is that you can define inline module that you can then uh, import or pass to a worker, for example, which is, you know, my primary use case. Because a lot of times you just want to create some code, then run it in a worker, and then normally you would have to like create a separate file for that or stringify it or whatever. There's like a bunch of hacks you can do that, and it's 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 a bit annoying, right? But in this case, you can just use the module um, scope and then write your module in there, and that will be passed to worker or import or whatever, and it will behave and work as a normal module, which actually opens quite a lot of doors for the like translation and uh, bundlers uh, to do some optimizations and things, which is kind of cool. I personally am mostly interested in this because I can write inline functions for my workers when I need to split the code basically. <laughs> but yes, it's a great proposal and it's now at stage two, which is uh, super awesome. So I cannot wait to see this shipped in the browser so I can actually use it. Right, uh, that's it for the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we are coming to the releases. We got three of them here today, starting with Firefox 85, that is uh, brings protection from super cookies, which is one of the most annoying forms of cookies, or I guess tracking on the network, on the internet, that's been around for ages and nobody did anything about that. But uh, Firefox now blocks them in the strict mode, I believe. So uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty awesome. And there's a bunch of other things. Oh yeah, probably another important thing is that Adobe Flash is now completely cut out of Firefox. So it no longer is even supported and will not work. And there's no setting to re-enable it. So keep that in mind if you are updating. Um, next thing we got here is Husky version five. This is the pretty major thing, a pretty major update, I guess, for the Husky, which is the pre-commit hooks that allow you to do things with your NPM or I guess node projects. And uh, yeah, it's a lot faster, a lot smaller. And like by a lot, I mean almost like 50 times faster. And I don't know, what is it? 50 times smaller, I guess, right? Yeah, so it seems like 50 times faster, 50 times smaller. Uh, but there are like breaking changes since it's a major update. Uh, Husky is a great little tool if you uh, have if you're working with a team essentially and want to maintain the specific code quality or standards or whatever. So running pre-commit hooks is um, pretty incredible with it, and it just got better basically. So there's no reason not to use that. Do check one. Uh, do check it out if you never heard about it. Absolutely recommend it. And if you're already using it, well, seems like version five is absolutely worth upgrading to. All right, last update we got here for today is npm version seven point five which adds new shiny npm diff command that allows you to actually compare files from published tarballs between two different versions of the packages, which is, let's just say, about freaking time. 
like this again this is a feature that people have been wanting for ages in the core i know that there are third-party services that basically allowed you to do that but yes now we can just do npm diff and it will work and you can just check what's changed and manually inspect files basically if you're not completely trusting the package you can just you know vet it yourself basically and it's it's great it's finally there so there you go all right that's it for leases now we got libs and demos we don't really have that many of them here today but uh some are pretty nice so the first one we got here is tiny x a tiny state manager that is uh yeah essentially a pla uh, not platform framework agnostic state manager that can be used with swelt react whatever you want basically uh borrows a lot from redux and emerge.js uh, but a lot more you know lightweight or smaller with simpler syntax supports middlewares and everything it looks fine yeah just you know another state manager so if you're if you're still not stopped on something if you're still looking for another one do check this one out maybe this is what you wanted continue we got site.js develop test and deploy your secure static or dynamic personal website with zero configuration a pretty nice tool for or i guess platform is not just a simple tool you can self-host the platform as far as i understand as well or you can deploy to the site.js uh, official website if you want to and uh yeah it's it's a website deployment static static website deployment uh platform so if you are interested in that do check this one out Next thing we got here is JerryScript, a project that's apparently been around for quite some time, but I've never encountered it before. So this is an ultra lightweight JavaScript engine for the Internet of Things. Somebody built a JavaScript engine that is basically can work on microcontrollers with devices with less than 64 kilobytes of RAM and less than 200 kilobytes of flash memory. And you can run JavaScript on that. Just Think about that for a second. It is absolutely bonkers, but you know, if you're working with IoT and you wanted to run JavaScript and needed something very efficient, do check this one out. Seems pretty damn cool. Continuing, we got Halia, extensible TypeScript and JavaScript dependency injection framework. We pretty much sums it up. So if you're into dependency injection and you wanted a framework to handle it for you, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Deno Cheerio, a Cheerio port uh, of, um, sorry, the port of Cheerio to Deno with typings included. Essentially, it's a wrapper around the current version of Cheerio with types added. Seems pretty solid, like this doesn't really do anything super complex, but you know, if you wanted to work with Cheerio and Deno and you wanted types, then this does exactly that. It's pretty solid, so uh, yeah, check it out. Next thing we got here is Coolify, a Heroku and Netlify alternative that you can self-host. Uh, there is a warning, keep in mind, this is still a beta. So there might be bugs, things might break, uh, some features might not be still there. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's sort of Heroku Netlify alternative platform, uh, works on Docker, uh, requires Docker Swarm, which uh, I guess, you know, I, I, I thought they deprecated that, but I guess not completely. Uh, also requires a bunch of other things such as MongoDB and DNS entry for the webhook. And yeah, doesn't seem to be, too easy to set up, but you know, again, the platforms of this kind of complexity are never super simple, super easy, basically. So if you are into things like this, do check it out. Seems uh, interesting, at least. Okay, continuing with Nightwind, an automatic, customizable, overridable Tailwind dark mode plugin. It's essentially a uh, plugin that enables uh, dark mode in uh, Tailwind out of the box with uh, preset colors and everything. Seems pretty solid. Like I am still wondering why Tailwind didn't do automated dark mode out of the box. I guess it's a bit hard to do it with the colors, right? So I guess it makes sense to some extent, but uh, yeah. So this one basically does it for Tailwind. Seems uh, quite solid. So if you're using Tailwind and you wanted an easy way to enable dark mode, do check this one out. Continuing, we got Parse XML, a fast, safe, and compliant XML parser for Node.js and browsers. I believe they just released the version three seven days ago, and uh, it's yeah now better than ever. So if you're still working with XML for some reason, first of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, you can try this library, and uh, maybe it will help you. So there we go. Next package we got here is Napi Meme. So this is the 
uh, node API and API uh, extension, or I guess, like, I'm not sure how to, is it not, not really a plugin, right? But it's, it's sort of a tool set that allows you to write Node.js native extensions in NIM. If you never heard about NIM, this is the language that aims to be uh, sort of as low level as C and C++, but as good and as nice to write as Python or Ruby with a lot of like developer productivity focused modules and niceties in uh, standard lib. So this seems pretty solid. Uh, again, Neem is quite nice. I never used it myself actually, but I did look through the tutorials and, and went through some uh, documentation that they have and it seems like a pretty damn good language. So if you ever wanted to write a very low level um, plugins for Node.js, but didn't want to touch C, C++, do check out Nappy Neem. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. All right, last thing we got here for today is SS Go. This is a minimalistic but flexible static site generator for Deno, pretty much sums it up. If you wanted to generate your static websites in Deno, do check this one out. That is it for the libs and demos. Now we got some interesting and silly stuff. We got a whole four articles here today, starting with a list of emails I received about inserting malware into my extension. So this is from the author of the sponsor block extension that is open source crowdsourced extension that essentially allows you to skip sponsor fragments and YouTube videos. And the author here collected all the emails that he got uh, from people basically asking him to insert different crap into extension, which is just, is terrifying to be honest. Like how would it, if the extension is not open source, I'm not even sure I would be willing to install it anymore after seeing how much crap they actually like the authors of semi-popular extensions get from like, you know, malicious third parties, it's just bonkers. But yeah, it's uh, terrifying and fascinating at the same time. So do check this one out. All right, next one is, I guess, uh, a PSA more than anything. GitLab is moving to a three tier product subscription model instead of the old five tier, I believe. So bronzers, uh, bronze starter tier is no longer a thing at all. And uh, a lot of people are unhappy about it because uh, the old tier that was relatively cheap and gave you everything you wanted as a small developer no longer exists. And the next tier is like three times more expensive, the premium one, and there's a lot of backlash about that. But you know, I guess I get the why they wanted to do this, but I'm, I wonder if that will end up uh, you know, well enough essentially. So if you're using GitLab and you were using one of the older tiers, make sure to check out the new pricing. And uh, yeah, that does not really look good for the people who were using the cheapest uh, tiers out there. So uh, just keep that in mind, basically. Next thing we got here is this uh, absolutely hilarious article about Stack Overflow 2019 hack that was guided by advice from, well, Stack Overflow. So the hacker who hacked Stack Overflow was using the answers from Stack Overflow about the tools he didn't know to figure out what to do when he actually breached the system, which is just hilarious, basically. Um, there's a bit more details in here. So if you're interested, do check it out. The last thing I got here for today is the announcement from Twitter, where uh, Twitter is actually opening up the full tweet archive to academic researchers for free. This as well goes for the Twitter API. So if you are academic researcher or you want to run some, you know, non-commercial essentially things, I'm not actually sure what the conditions are basically, but if you want to work with Twitter data set or if you want to work with Twitter API and you're doing it as a non-commercial developer, as far as I understand, you can basically get access to it and uh, do some analysis, which could be extremely fun. So like for researchers, this is amazing because it was always an incredible pain in ass to scrape tweets or try to get some, you know, Twitter related data sets when we had to do some micro language analysis or whatever, it was always like, okay, let's just turn on this bot and wait for like three days to collect a few thousand, hundred thousand tweets and then use that as a data set. While in reality, you can actually get a whole full dump now and just work with that, which is awesome. So there you go. Right, um, that's it from my side. So thank you guys very much for watching. As usual, you can find all the links on github.com slash buildingxwithjs slash bxjsweekly or on bxjs.dev. You can join our Discord and discuss any of that. Um, you know, if you like the video, do leave a like and a comment that uh, helps with the video rankings immensely. Um, what else is there? Well, you can follow the Twitter of BXJS where I repost things uh, for now manually. Again, we're gonna be doing a live stream where we will build a Twitter bot at some point. 
And uh, that's basically it from my side. So once again, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I see you next time. Bye.